full of uncertainty. There's one thing we know for sure. That one thing, we're all going to die. Death's actually the only absolute in this life, and yet, we don't talk about it. If anything, we avoid the topic at all costs. I get it. Thinking about death is really scary, right? Imagine tomorrow you're at a doctor's appointment. She walks in and she says, I've got some tough news. You know those headaches you've been complaining about? Well, it turns out it's a brain tumor. And I'm sorry to say this, but there's not much else we can do. We think you've got probably a couple months left to live. Instantly, your entire life has changed. That work thing you were stressed about, the argument you have with your spouse, the concerns you had about the 10 pounds that you couldn't lose, none of it matters, right? The retirement savings you were squirreling away, you're not gonna live long enough to spend it and you can't take it with you. The thing is, death is absolute. And basically, when I found out, when I was 38 years old, in September of 2018, I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Um, it was the worst kind of breast cancer. It was uh, basically, you know, highly emotional for me to talk about, obviously. Um, triple negative, it's the most aggressive, it has the least available treatment options. You know, before this, friends would have said I was one of the healthiest people they knew. You know, I uh, didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't do drugs. And essentially, um, when the shock came, it really hit hard. Um, and we didn't find it early. I was diagnosed stage four, uh, locally advanced non-metastatic, which meant that the cancer had spread, um, but uh, not to my vital organs. So it was bad, but not incurable. Essentially, uh, when I thought about it, you know, I had these questions, right? It was, you know, what if the treatment doesn't work? What if I uh, die in a year? Um, so I did what any normal person does. I started Googling. <laughs> um, this was a terrible idea. Um, zero stars would not recommend. Why? Because, well, this is me. It's three o'clock in the morning. I am huddled over my phone. Um, I've stumbled upon the Instagram of a woman who will call her Susan, and she has the same cancer as I do. I'm scrolling through photos of her in treatment. I end up, um, you know, finding out that she's in remission. I smile, this makes me feel good. Um, but then I see that, you know, her cancer's come back. And, but Susan's a fighter, you know, she's not gonna let this get her down. I scroll hurriedly to the top of the screen um, to find out how she's doing now, only to find the most recent post written not by Susan, um, but by her son, sharing the sad news that her, his, uh, his mother had actually lost her fight with the disease and had died. In this moment, I am devastated, right? Tears flowing down my cheeks. I'm sobbing, trying to keep it down so I don't wake up my partner who's asleep beside me. In the light of day, I try and write down my fears. It doesn't work. And the thought of having a face-to-face -face conversation about my very real concerns about an early death from cancer, having that with my partner or my family just seems impossible, right? They've already been through so much, I don't wanna cause them any more pain. You know, but there were a couple friends and my therapist who were able to sit with me in that emotional space um, and let me talk about death, dying, and really everything in between. And you know what? Instead of finding myself in some hole, this some puddle of tears that I couldn't pull myself out of, you know, it was quite the opposite. I started to feel better. So then it was like, well, now what, right? You know, I'm your classic type A. I'm intense. I like plans, right? Many would call me extra. Um, for context, the day before uh, starting chemotherapy, I went to Staples to stock up on office supplies to prepare for cancer treatment. <laughs> Serious. I bought a dry erase, mar uh, dry erase board calendar where I mapped out all of my different doctor's appointments, of course, color-coded. I got a journal where I documented to the minute my meds, what I was eating, what I was feeling, my side effects, my symptoms, so that I could try and track patterns over time. I even started a Google Doc to communicate with my inner circle because I decided that individual text strings was just inefficient. <laughs> but I didn't write up a project plan for this. I didn't write down goals and objectives. You know, I didn't pen some grand manifesto because 
processing the idea of dying, you know, it wasn't about thinking my way through it up here in my head. It was about feeling here in my heart. And what did I feel? Terror, uh, paralyzing anxiety, uh, like the floor had been pulled out from under me, you know, and that though was all to be expected. You know, what was unexpected was what I found on the other side of my very real death anxiety. I found clarity and perspective. It was like I, I gained a superpower overnight and instantly I knew what mattered. It was very clear, there was no gray area, no questions, you know, looks, money, success, none of it carried the weight that it once did. The only thing that matters to me now is my health. I just wanna beat this cancer and live long enough to get old and wrinkly and eat pudding and play bingo, right? <laughs> Doesn't sound too bad. The reality is um, the clarity and perspective that I've gained, you know, in the world where all we care about is lying about our age and coloring our gray hair and hiding our wrinkles, right? All I'm asking for is the privilege of growing old, you know, and if I can do that, everything else is gravy. Urgency. I don't know about you, but there's nothing that motivates me more than a countdown clock. So the awareness of the fact that our time is inevitably going to run out um, might, you know, drive us to be more productive, to accomplish more. Um, for me, though, it can make me anxious and it can make me feel scattered, right? It's, it's like I'm the, the white rabbit uh, from Alice in Wonderland, you know, scurrying around town like a crazy person with bug eyes, pulling out my pocket watch and showing it to everybody and going, I'm late, I'm late, you know? But on better days, when I'm more centered, that urgency can drive me to be more productive, help me be more focused, and make sure that I'm spending my time on the things that bring me joy, fulfillment, gratitude. Giving versus getting. Ever wonder why your 95-year-old grandmother seems obsessed with giving you her good china? It's called mortality legacy awareness, and it means the closer we get to death, um, the more focused we become on thinking about what we're going to leave behind when we're gone. Um, and I'm not talking about grandma's favorite gravy boat here. Um, I'm talking about, you know, leaving a legacy, leaving this world a little bit better than you found it, a little bit richer, thinking about what you can give versus what you can get. You know, what's my legacy? If I can compel just one person in the room tonight to think about their life differently, so that when they're on their deathbed, they don't have any regrets, you know, that's my legacy. And I think it beats a gravy boat. <laughs> and gratitude. Now, Jesus may have turned water into wine, which is very impressive. <laughs> but gratitude, you know, gratitude turns everything we have into enough. Now, for someone like me who is just driven to go to the next thing, to push for more, to never settle, the realization that I have everything I need is such a relief, and I do. Today, after 15 months of treatment, I'm in a great position to beat this thing. I went through five months of chemo. That was five months of chemo, a mastectomy in which I lost my breast, two months of daily radiation, and six months of oral chemo. Uh, so it was a lot. Uh, my hair is starting to come back, as you can see, it's not the long, luscious locks that I had before cancer, and I am fighting against a mullet on some days. <laughs> but I'll take it, you know? And same goes for my eyebrows. You know you've been through something real if you're grateful for eyebrows. <laughs> and you know, one of the hardest things for me to go through during treatment was the loss of independence, the feeling like I was cooped up, like I was restricted, you know? And now I'm free, you know, I'm free to work, I'm free to be in a crowded public place like this and not be obsessed with purelling everything. You know, I'm free to travel and free to fly without wearing a mask. You know, it's an incredible feeling having once been so restricted because my life depended on it. Only to have that cage door open and feel like I can flap my wings, you know, even if it means I'm leaving a trail of feathers behind me because I'm just so excited about life. You know, you can live a life like that, like this with this kind of vibrant color, you know, and rich meaning and intention. You can start right now. First, yeah, saw this guy um, as depicted by uh, 
Tom Hanks over Christmas when I went to see the movie with my family, and I was reminded, you know, um, Mr. Rogers, he wasn't afraid to talk about death, even with young kids. You know, Mr. Rogers said, to die is human, and anything human is mentionable. Anything mentionable is manageable. You know, when we share our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less scary. And when we find an important person to have that talk with, it reminds us that we're not alone. So tonight, on your way home, I want you to talk with the people you came here with. I want you to have the courage to be vulnerable and share what it felt like when I asked you to think about your own death. Give the fear a voice and you will take the power out of it. Next, I want you to count your blessings. Hashtag blessed, <laughs> right? Gratitude, as I mentioned, you know, turns everything we have into enough. So tonight, I want you to write down before you go to sleep five things you're grateful for. Now, they could be big things like, you know, my health, my family, my faith. Little things work too, though. Could be, I live in Arizona, so I can wear flip-flops all year round. <laughs> yeah, that's a blessing. Uh, it could be, hey, I was doing my laundry, and oh my gosh, I found $10 in my jeans pocket. Who doesn't love that, right? When you are in the weeds of gratitude, you will be amazed at what you notice. And the more energy and focus you put on that gratitude, it will grow. And finally, do the things that light you up. You can see here the things that light me up, right? Travel, adventure, sports, the outdoors. For you, it might be spending time with your kids or your dog. It could be jamming out with your band. It could be gardening, whatever. So I want you to start a life list, okay? A life list is not a bucket list, the things you wanna do before you die, although those things can sit on this list too. This is about big things and little things that are gonna bring you joy. I started my life list when I was 15. You can see here, this is an actual copy, a bridge, but an actual copy. It's got things on it like go on an African safari, learn how to surf, uh, give a deserving restaurant server a $100 tip. Yeah, and I'm happy to say I actually checked all of those off in 2019. So tonight I challenge every single one of you, at some point tonight, maybe even here at this event, maybe in intermission, whenever you find yourself with two minutes, pull out your phone. And instead of mindlessly scrolling through Instagram, right? I want you to instead start a note, and title it Life List. And tonight, I want you to put at least one thing down on that list. Tomorrow morning, I want you to wake up, and I want you to put more things on that list. Don't hold back. Big things, little things. And start thinking about how you can craft a life where you can begin to check those things off before it's too late. You know, sadly for too many of us, we don't think about kind of our life until it is almost too late. You know, the five things that people most regret when they're on their deathbed. One, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself instead of the expectations of other people. Two, I wish I worked less. Three, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Four, I wish I stayed in touch with my friends. And five, I wish I had let myself be happier. Right? So I take you back to that earlier scenario. If you found out tomorrow that your time is almost up, what regrets would you have? I have thought more about my death in the last year and a half than I have in the last 39 years combined. It's not easy, right? Anxiety still makes it hard for me to fall asleep. Fear jolts me up in the middle of the night. Stories of people's cancer coming back, of it silently spreading through the body of some poor soul, right, who's living life with gusto, like me, because they think they're cured, only to have the cancer come back stronger than ever and kill them. The fear can be paralyzing. I know. But what I've learned is that by facing my own death anxiety, I have been able to live a fuller life. Ernest Becker, the guy who wrote The Denial of Death, said, guilt results from the unlived life. I don't want to be on my deathbed going, there was still life to live. I want to live like Thoreau said, and I want to suck the marrow out of life. Right? I want to put my head down on the pillow at the end of the day without regrets, looking back at the memories that I created from that last 24 hours and go, man, I really did it, right? And then I wanna say a prayer that I have the privilege of waking up the following morning and getting to do it all over again. You don't have to wait for a health scare like me, rock bottom, or anything else to have you understand 
that you can approach your life differently. If you are able to conquer your own death anxiety and face it, you could live a life full of more meaning and more intention than you ever, ever imagined. And maybe by rebranding death, we can all live a fuller life. But don't wait until your time runs out. Live and love like there's no time to waste.